War and conflict have plagued humanity since even before the recorded history, with the first tools of destruction being as old as man himself. As times progressed, people felt the need to gradually evolve warfare and fighting forces into more and more organized forms, and technological development brought about subsequent innovations in weaponry. When we think of the medieval era, we often have a very stereotypical depiction in mind of a knight in shiny armor wielding a sword and a shield. However, we often overlook the use of other prominent melee weapons such as maces and axes, which were often the most popular weapons employed by medieval combatants. Metal-plated armor was often a privilege only the wealthy and noble could afford, whilst chainmail, albeit a bit cheaper, was also something reserved for those who had the means. Despite the notion of being largely disorganized due to uncertainty following the fall of the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages did have certain dedicated organizations that would shape and influence a number of things, including warfare. Although no uniform and prominent artistic encapsulation of what could be called the martial arts was a common dictator, certain specialties were taught over generations either through family tradition with young boys learning from their fathers and mentors, or through a series of guilds. The most popular medieval guilds known as, per the knowledge we have today, is perhaps the teachings of Johannes Leichtenauer, a German fencing master of great influence who lived somewhere in the 13th century. Although no official manuscripts recording his teachings survive, some of what he taught and all of what we know is preserved through a number of mnemonic poems told on through generations by his disciples. Among the many known medieval martial arts, remnants are Johannes' teachings, Kampfring, unarmed grappling, longsword wielding, armor handling, horseback dueling, dagger fighting, archery, and basic techniques of using other melee weapons such as axes. However, all of these are fragmented pieces of knowledge and no uniformity of teachings is known, minus Johannes' poems. A popular form of the battle axe that was used was the pole axe. The pole axe was a popular infantry weapon used and modified throughout the Middle Ages and most significantly during the late Middle Ages. The modifications of the pole axe were ultimately intended to make the weapon capable of breaching plate armor. A long wooden haft would allow for greater length at the pivoting center, which was the wielder's hands. This allowed for greater momentum to be generated and gave a large circumference for maximum acceleration and speed and maximized lethal force on impact. The poleaxe had a large steel head with a sharp wide edge, but sometimes the head would be double-edged to allow for both sides usability. This would save the wielder a couple of seconds in the case he needed to strike another target standing parallel to the first one immediately. This could be of crucial importance in fast-paced combative actions. Knights, as well as men-at-arms, used this popular variation of the combat axe in battle. Le Jeu de la Hache is a 13th century French manual that documents a number of techniques in which the pole axe may be effectively employed. Other battle axes were also frequently used as defensive weapons. The reason axes were typically such a popular weapon was the availability and multifaceted uses the tool could provide. Peasants were often at the disposal of their lords should they be called to arms, and hence the axe was very significant, as most households already possessed one for the purpose of cutting firewood. This abundance, along with its lethal potential, made for a perfect makeshift weapon. As well as battles backed by political agenda, Combat in medieval times was not limited to such meaningful constraints. With widespread lawlessness and a strong prevalence of feudalism, there were many other ways for violence to pave its way into everyday society matters. Often when traveling, the fear of bandits and wild beasts made sure that travelers carried weapons with them. Fighting also played a major role in entertainment, where two combatants would often fight it out to please spectators. This was especially common in noble or royal courts, where important people in society would come seeking pleasure and amusement. Another important use of violence was dispensing justice and upholding honor, which was demonstrated in duels. When in a duel, 
Two combatants would face each other off in equal settings with similar weapons and armor. They would also be subject to predefined rules. These were a common sight when two parties disagreed on a legal matter or were thus judicially liable to duel each other, expecting God to make the just man the victor. Sometimes it was a matter of honor rather than a formal legal dispute, and each participant wished to defend his name in the eyes of the public. A depiction of medieval duels can be seen in this video where two participants, Simon and Brett, reenact a medieval style duel for warlordsports.com. Before we go ahead, I want to tell you that these are perfectly legal arrangements that ensure no fatality occurs and are simply for amusement and education. Many societies today conduct such reenactments and duels for these purposes, and large-scale organizations such as the International Medieval Combat Federation endorse and oversee such activities. The weapons used by the men in the video are axes, and their armor is a combination of chainmail and metal plate. They probably have blunt weapons to prevent fatalities, and likely have additional cushioning alongside traditional medieval padding. Simon, the Red Pants, is seen entering the ring to a cheering crowd as would be back in the days. The neutral clashing of weapons was also common etiquette during medieval duels when combatants wished to express their respect for their opponent and their approval of their worthiness. Just as seen in the video, assistance was often needed to wear armor, and squires typically filled this role. As soon as the fight starts, Simon brings his weapon down in a vertical slash. This typically aims to attack the head and slice the helmet, hoping to deal a fatal blow. However, the predictability allowed Brett to intercept with his own weapon immediately. As seen, due to the weight of the weapon and the staggering caused by heavy armor, fast movements were often restricted. Thus, fists and kicks were just as useful in re-establishing a safe distance. Honor dictated that a fallen enemy mustn't be attacked. This explains why Simon chose to wait when Brett lost his balance. As Brett attacks Simon, a sharper weapon could have potentially pierced the armor and sliced off his hand. Fatal blows weren't always necessary so long as your enemy was made immobile. In the second round, Simon begins with an extended swing to maximize his blow's speed. Should it have hit, Brett may have been incapacitated. Upon Brett's disarmament, his instinct was to close distance and grapple his opponent, limiting his weapon's effectiveness, a prime example of why wrestling and grappling were popular techniques. Despite being unarmed, this action allows Brett to change the tide of the battle, and he uses Simon's own weight against him. The curvature in the underside of the axe edge allowed Simon to hook into Simon's armor and bring him down. This also explains the design dynamics of battle axes. Brett re-employs his grappling expertise to lock Simon's head between his own and the haft of his axe and then deal critical knees to the gut that would have his opponent disoriented. In the end, just as in a medieval duel, should it not be a fight to the death, the option of forfeit was available. Of course, in this modern reenactment, Simon was declared the loser without any mortality. In actual medieval duels, the whim of the victor decided his opponent's fate. Medieval combat has been a large and interesting topic for research. However, the martial aspects have, unfortunately, been poorly documented. Where we do have records of war, emphasis on individual fighting styles lack documentation. I hope this was an interesting insight into medieval martial techniques. And that concludes our video. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit the like button to show your support. Also, if you want to see more fight-related content, make sure you subscribe and ring the notification bell. Thanks for watching.